tikina ngā kite o te wānanga, tikina ngā kaipapo o te wā e hōkai nei, whera whera atu, hei whāriki kōrero. Welcome to Mata with me, Mihi Ngārangi Forbes, brought to you by Te Māngai Pāho and Irirangi Te Motu, New Zealand on Air. Kāri e a rika rika ngā kaupapa kōrero, hei mata paki mā tātou. Panelists Kylie Quince and Matt Tukaki reflect on the first 100 days of the coalition government. We'll discuss political claims of judicial activism in Aotearoa, as well as fast-tracked changes to the RMA and what it means for Māori. Ingari mātuara he kaupapa taiao. Last month, veteran Māori environmental activist Mike Smith won the right to sue some of Aotearoa's big polluters for their role in causing climate change. The Supreme Court ruling means Smith will have his day in court after it was struck out earlier by the Court of Appeal. Smith's case involves seven companies, including Fonterra and Z Energy, in a bid to have them reduce their emissions. The decision has sent a shiver up Shane Jones's spine, accusing the court of flexing its muscle, while legal experts say it may open a new avenue in climate law. Nō reira hei matapaki i tēnei kēhi, ko honu mai, te whatukurara a Mike Smith. Tēnā koe, Mike, walk us through your case. You have filed an action against seven carbon admitting companies, including Fonterra Z Energy and Genesis. Yeah, well, they're the uh, top polluters of the Aotearoa, and so they're responsible for about 30% of this country's emissions. And so I guess the fundamental concern is that the government is going soft on uh, the polluting industries and won't um, take the appropriate action to bring them into line with our international obligations to reduce emissions as fast as possible. And um, I guess there's like a, the horns of a dilemma that the government's faced with on one side, it's the power of the lobbying industries and external influences, uh, you know, from overseas uh, networks and things that influence policy within New Zealand in favour of big industries like the fossil fuel industry, for example. And so that type of pressure is brought to bear on the government. And then on the other hand, there's they're fearful of the public backlash if they're seen to be going too hard on climate issues. And so that leads to a, a form of... Um, political inertia and uh, so we're going to the courts to get uh, binding decisions on behalf of the court that uh, instruct the uh, companies that they must uh, start reducing their emissions at speed and uh, that if they don't they'll be liable for compliance and enforcement actions. So the crux of your case is that the energy companies are causing you as an individual harm? Yes well they are and not only just me but also for um you know, like people right around the world. But in this particular case, it is focusing on the impact that it's having to my whānau and to our whenua in the far north. But of course, that's, you know, that's illustrative of the impact that it's having to all of our families everywhere in Aotearoa. So there's a specific tikanga Māori element to your case, um, which includes yourself, your hapu, your iwi. Yes, and so the courts of this country are now starting to consider uh, tikanga as you know the grounds for evidence. They'll consider that within uh, prosecutions, and so we're going to t- test that, I guess, in regard to some of the evidence that we'll be giving. So it went to the High Court, um, the Court of Appeal, and finally the Supreme Court. Um, it's the Supreme Court that has ruled there is a case to be heard. What happens next? We go to court now, so the case will be heard in the High Court. Uh, we're not too sure when exactly, but we're anticipating that it will be in 2025 or possibly 26. And so what we will do is start assembling the evidence, the um, expert witnesses that will call to give evidence in the trial. And uh, we get to apply for discovery, which means we get to see the defences that the defendants are going to be running. And we have a chance to analyse those as well to see how we will speak to their defences of these actions. And so I guess it's a case preparation at the moment. And um, we'll be getting on with that. When you do get to see the discovery, um, how important will that be? Will it be stuff you've never seen before, do you think? Yeah, well, it will. You know, we're in, we'll be asking questions like, well, when did your company first hear about climate change and how do you rank it as a, you know, as an issue and what sort of reports have you commissioned uh, in respect to the impacts it's having on your particular business? What have you done about that? You know, have you taken any action? And if not, why not? So it's all of those kinds of questions will be rolled out as part of that inquiry. He tawira mo te ao. Will this be an example of first in the world? 
Yes, it will. Um, it will be. And um, so it opens the opportunity for other illegal claims of a similar nature, not only here within Aotearoa, but right around the Western world, at least. And so this case is being watched with great interest by you know jurists around the world. When you talk about the evidence that you're going to provide on behalf of your hapu and your, your whānau, can you give us an example of some real impacts of greenhouse gases, um, what these emitters allegedly cause? Yeah, so um, you know, we can already observe the types of changes that climate uh, change is impacting upon our people, and they're the things that everybody's heard about. So we're suffering droughts in the north, and some of our towns have come within days of running out of uh, drinkable water, and that causes all kinds of problems. You know, you can't wash, you can't eat. You know, the crops, are, you can't water your crops or the animals. And we've seen that already, and that's a recurring thing that's happening year after year now. It's blisteringly hot this summer. It's been really, really hot, and it's been, um, you know, I look at some of our whānau out there working on the outside and uh, industries and activities outside, and, you know, I'm sure that's having health implications uh, for them. We've seen the storms, you know, cyclone uh, hail and Gabriel, affected not only Hiri Hiri Taunga, but also for us in the north. And so we've seen homes destroyed, um, coastal erosion, uh, roads and bridges go down. Uh, we're having more reoccurring flooding events. They say that they're once in 100 year events, but then less than 100 days later, we have another one. So we're seeing these these problems occurring with far more regularity, mate. Are you getting a lot of interest from other iwi or hapu or other whanau? Yeah, well, I'm just down here at Wanganui at the moment. Uh, we're at a climate uh, hui uh, here, and so in the room next door, there's a couple of hundred people, and we're all looking at what the issues are and how they can become more resilient uh, in their communities. Um, I'm continuously getting asked to travel to different places and and to talk about not so much the illegal case, but you know, what are the um, ways that we can prevent runaway climate change and how do we cope with the baked in of uh, impacts that are going to happen to us so, you know, there's, um, I think we've turned a corner in terms of awareness on the climate and the issues, and people are really starting to lean into it now, which is great. But um, what we've also got to be, I think, concerned about is uh, preventing, you know, it's not just about adapting to climate change. We've got to do the best we can to to prevent it, you know, to reduce the emissions, to challenge the industries, to challenge the government. And um, we all need to be part of that. You know, not everybody can do the science, not everybody has got their hands on the levers of power, but we can all raise our voices together and create the type of mandate that's required for the government and our own uh, iwi authorities and our own iwi businesses to start developing uh, climate plans and to prepare for what's coming. Just on a personal note, you know, through the 90s you were a land right activist and involved, um, you know, with the likes of Shane Jones and Hone Harawira and Ken Mia. Did you ever imagine that you were going to be the single, the single guy that took on the energy companies over climate change? Um, yes, I've always been a bit of a sucker for a suicide mission, <laughs> you might say. But you know, I think so because you know, as you know me, um, we live close to nature, and a lot of our, you know, a lot of our tikanga, a lot of our mahi toy, a lot of our waiata, our our, our very atua tanga is centred in Te Aotearoa. And so it's embedded, it's built into us to be concerned about these things. And when you have an analysis about who's doing it to us, you know, that this isn't something that's happening naturally, but this is as a result of, you know, a couple of hundred years of exploitation, of extractive industries, of colonisation. Climate change is the end game of all of that. And so when you roll all of that together, it becomes almost, you know, if you're a responsible adult, parent, kaumatu, a koro, mm. You have to stand up for these things. You know, we don't really have any choice. We can't just hide in the corner and uh, pretend it's not happening. I mentioned Shane Jones, your old mate from the protest days, because I wonder what you make of his comments. You know, he's talking about judicial activism in terms of this particular case. How do you respond to his response to your case? Oh, well, Shane, you know, many years ago, he kind of left the fold, as it were, and um, he ventured into the realm of, um, you know, venture capitalism and all those types of things. And so, you know, that's who he is these days. And it's unfortunate, but, you know, he's not the only one. The lens that he sees everything through is the lens of the status quo, the lens of the colonial economic systems. But that's yesterday's fish and chips. The sun's going down on all of that. And so... Um, 
I don't know, my message to Shane is te te roa tu ki te taumata o te moana, because kei reira te aitua nui nui kei te haere. Mm. And if we're going to be prepared, if we're going to be prepared and future-proof our families, um, we've got to see that there's going to be a global economic collapse like there was with COVID. You know, these types of, the scale of these types of things really does undermine the so-called economic orthodoxy. Mm. And that's a good thing. I think we really need to transition into new the new ways of doing more sustainable ways of, of living on Papatunaku. And of course, our people uh, have got a lot to offer of that. Some commentators would say these companies who admit greenhouse gases are already paying their price through the purchasing of carbon credits in the ETS. I wonder what your thoughts on the ETS are. Is it the silver bullet people say it is? No, it's not really fit for purpose, and it really needs to be kicked into touch, in my opinion. You know, there's a glut of uh, units at the moment, the climate credits, the people are just not buying them, it's not working. And the idea of spending uh, taxpayers' money on buying international credits when we have got problems within our own society that we need to be investing in solutions, I think is a really backward-looking way of doing it. It's it's just consistent with the, the kind of market, if you like, you know, that the, the somehow you're going to have these market mechanisms that are going to fix the market problems, but they're all the same problem. And so we're not going to achieve, I think, the types of solutions by um, using failed systems. We've got to be prepared to really do some major transitional and transformational um, thinking around, uh, you know, what wealth is, how do we measure it? Uh, how, uh, how is it distributed? Uh, what sort of systems are fit for purpose in a, in a climate challenged world? And we just can't keep raping and pillaging our way across the planet like, like you know, the colonisers uh, have been doing, uh, you know, for the last couple of centuries. It's just not sustainable. Just before we go, um, Mike, the first hundred days is up for the new coalition. How would you rate them? Oh well, let's hope that they we're going into the last hundred days of the coalition. I think. You know, the sooner we um, show them the door, the better it is. And it seems like the wheel's falling off. You know, you've got, um, you know, Winston Peters is making ridiculous statements like, you know, that this is um, akin to, um, you know, what coalition, I mean... Co-governance um, in Nazi Germany. Yeah, co-governance is Nazi Germany. I mean, they're the co-governance uh, government. Um, we're not. They're the ones that have entered into this, um, this kind of freak show co-governance parliament, stomping around trying to wipe out minorities and, you know, and other progressive uh, movements and uh, progressive thinking. So, you know, is that who we are as New Zealanders? And if we are, we've got to take a long, hard look in the mirror if we're saying that that's, that they're representative of the views of the average uh, Kiwi. If, if they are, we're in trouble. Fair to say that wasn't a 10 out of 10. Mike, tēnā koe, thank you for your time today and we'll be watching your case uh, with interest. Thanks, mate. You're listening to Mata with me, Mihingarangi Forbes. To discuss all the latest in politics, I'm joined now by AUT Law Dean and resident Star Wars expert, Kylie Quince, and Chairman of the National Māori Authority, Matt Tukaki. Tēnā kōrua. Kia ora. Yes, we've just been listening to Mike Smith, kaitiaki and climate activist. He's filed a suit against seven companies that emit carbon emissions and he says are causing him harm. The case went to the High Court, to the Appeal Court. It was struck out, then back to the Supreme Court, which has decided that it should be heard in the lower court. Matt, how significant is that decision? I think it's pretty significant because I think the um, when you read the particularly the press releases from the February from the Supreme Court itself, which maybe really puts out press releases like this, um, it gives you a clear indication in respect of well, actually, there is something to answer here. Um, what needs to be answered and the questions that need to be put will be determined by the, the process, the trial, to me, to me, to me. But what I thought was really interesting is this being a case involving Fonterra. And while a lot of New Zealanders might say that, look, you know, we're a small country, uh, we're nothing compared to China or India, that's like the escape clause. We've got to be responsible for what it is we do and what our share of the um, emissions are around the world. And if you have a look at the emissions based on 2022-23, Fonterra by far 
had the largest emissions in in New Zealand. And that's something not to be proud of. It's not a trophy you want in your cabinet. So I can kind of understand why Fonterra would rather not be in the Supreme Court. And don't forget, this is also the same company that, irrespective of emissions, a couple of years ago tried to um, trademark any number of Māori colours or Māori name words for colours like Kōwhai. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, there's a lot of interest in this case more generally. Shane Jones says matters like this should be decided by the people's elected representatives, not, and I'm quoting him here, the Americanized court system that gives power to unelected judges. Kylie, is this an attack on the judiciary from a member of the executive? Uh, short answer is yes, yes, it is. And he's just plain wrong, though. So it, it's incorrect. This is, from a law nerd's perspective, this is a, an exciting and interesting decision because this is how the common law works. You know, this is mm. this is the law of tort. Um, law of tort is where the state or public authorities are not involved. It's just between citizens. So between Mike as kaitiaki with mana whenua, mana moana, um, protecting those interests against these seven emitters, including... Um, Fonterra, as as Matt has just said, and the common law is literally the law of the common people. That's how it. That is that's colonizer law, and that means that it changes over time. And that's the role of the courts to develop and take into account new forms of tort, uh, whether that's a nuisance or negligence. But climate change litigation is going to be one of the great mm-hmm. new developments in law globally, and this is our a version of that, if you like, but the world was watching us because, um, you know, as Mike has said, this is our last chance to say to save the planet. So, uh, and I think Shane's just wrong. This is the legitimate role of the judiciary and of the common law um, to develop over time. They did this in the 19th century with industrial laws, with the Industrial Revolution, in terms of, you know, thinking about new forms of rights and protections, particularly for workers. So this is business as usual for the courts. Interesting, it comes out of the Supreme Court because, of course, this is about also, you know, the incorporation and acknowledgement of tikanga as part Mm. of the common law of this country. Yeah. Can I just quickly add to that, if you don't mind? I mean, what I found really interesting about this case, and particularly going back to that press release by the Supreme Court of the 7th of February, was the the mention of the, 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 the three causes of action in relation to tort, including public nuisance, negligence, and a proposed climate system damage tort. Now, in respect to the last one, which I found really fascinating, is, of course, um, when it comes to the emissions count for 2023, one of the largest emitters in New Zealand, aside from Fonterra, was Silver Fern Farms. And Silver Fern Farms were also likely a little bit confused at how their emissions reduced in 2023 compared to 2022, because they noted in their comments to the media at the time, RNZ, that actually we, uh, we're not sure how it happened, but we believe it must have been in the structure of how the emissions are accounted for, which is interesting because that last part of talk, which is the proposed climate system damage, it's not just about the damage to the environment, it's about whether or not the system around how things have been accounted for is actually fit for purpose in a country like Mm. New Zealand. Um, And further to that point, just quickly, it doesn't mean to say that they did anything to lower their emissions. It's just the way that the structure was uh, was changed to allow them to account for their emissions. Mm. It's going to be a very interesting case that we'll all keep our eyes and ears tuned to. One thing I wanted to ask you, Kylie, just before we move on, is that there has been some criticism of some politicians who have been talking about judicial activism. I wonder if you can explain why the separation of powers is important between the different branches of government? Sure. Well, you know, as as we know, in a functional democracy, the, the three branches of government act as checks and balances on one another so that neither is, um, you know, we don't live in a dictatorship, so that neither is supremely you know, in, in charge or dominant over the other. Uh, and so the judiciary is there to make sure that Parliament is working in accordance with the rule of law. We've seen numerous challenges in the past hundred days, shall we say, uh, with the number of pieces of legislation that have been passed under urgency. Um, so there are things that are both part of our, our written constitution, and then there are customs in terms of the way that these different branches of government operate to 
Yeah, to keep an eye on one another. So mm. the judiciary is a watchdog to make sure that parliament doesn't overstep the mark. So yeah. any politician that tells you that judges are being uh, activist is, of course, making a comment about, you know, the, the judiciary being quite zealous in protecting um, the, the rights of, of citizens. Yeah, let's talk about one of those pieces of legislation that's coming up. It's the Fast Tracked RMA. What do you both make of it? The RMA's consents, so, so it's been called the, the one-stop shop for a number of laws like the RMA's consent, the Conservation Act's concessions, the Wildlife Act's prohibited authority, Heritage New Zealand's archaeological authority, the exclusive Economic Zone's marine consents, uh, the Crown's Mineral Act's land access and the Fisheries Act Act's agriculture approvals. Matt, given so much of it is at stake here for the mm. minerals, lands, environment, animals, histories, shouldn't this be um, carefully considered? Yeah, I have a problem with fast track legislation more generally. Um, I tend to think that, look, if you want to learn a lesson from previous governments, moving too quickly at pace with too much to do leads to unintended or sometimes intended consequence, uh, and that never ended well. And it didn't end well, not just for vulnerable groups, i.e. Māori, um, and also what we're battling for, but vulnerable um, groups that can't speak for themselves, and I mean our fauna, our flora, our um, our species, you know, people don't know this, but there are dozens, hundreds of, of native species in this country that are endangered. We would be we would be wise to take that into account. And when you deprive these voices of a say or those who can advocate on their behalf through the parliamentary process, it actually makes a mockery mm. of democracy. It doesn't enhance democracy. It might enhance stuff for yeah. the developers. It might enhance stuff for minerals companies, but it doesn't improve the lives and the lot of vulnerable people and species. Kylie, you know, if challenged, will this fast track bill stand up in court, do you think? Oh, good question. I mean, as most of the, to add to what Matt's just said, as most of the objectors so far have said, it's anti-democratic, it's anti-nature, and it's arguably anti-Maori. Uh, if there are going to be challenges, it will certainly be from the environmentalists and probably probably iwi spheres. Um, so if it stands up in court, if there's any perceived attack on treaty settlements and I know Chris Bishop has said that they are mindful of protecting treaty settlements, but of course that's only what's that's backwards looking. That's what's in the bag already. There are future, and we're thinking, you know, the connection to Mike Smith's litigation here. There are there are interests in the Taiao in terms of the future. There are interests in broader climate. You know that uh, two thirds of the conservation estate is within Naitahu Takiwa. Uh, yeah. They've already come out to say they are concerned about that. So. I think the the focus purely on treaty settlements is is too narrow, and so there there are possible judicial review or you know litigation interests from the environmentalist and Maori spheres. I suspect both of those would have a pretty reasonable chance. I think, uh, yeah. partly for the reason that Matt's mentioned that doing things quickly is is hardly ever works out well in terms of lawmaking. Kapai and Kylie, just quickly, the 100 days is up for this coalition. Highlights for you? Takeaways? Uh, Thoughts? Uh, Takeaways, same same thing, but um, uh, in relation to doing things quickly, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see that there's any, it's, it's never a good rationale to, to do things well, to do things quickly, uh, e even if you have a good underlying reason for it. It's been extremely trying time for, for us as Māori, of course, and other vulnerable peoples. But, you know, as we've seen at the Hui Amutu and uh, Waitangi, you know, uh, you know, we've heard some of that um, uh, whakaro, that korero, that, you know, po possibly this government's done more to galvanise Māori together uh, than any government in, in living memory. So that's right, and another right. hui has been ko karanga hia te tehi hui anō ki Ngāti Kahungunu. That's coming up in a month or so. So, Matt, just with you, your takeaways from the first 100 days in coalition? Yeah, I think if there's any lesson in this, it's the, the recalibration of the political narrative. Um, New Zealanders are becoming switched on to the fact that, look, when you want to say we're going to get things done in 100 days or 200 days, the reality is they all know now that switching a, or flicking a switch rather, at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning isn't going to work. New Zealanders are not that stupid. Um, so I think what this has done is it's re-highlighted what we already knew or validated what we already knew, that it takes good time 
to make good policy. Um, now, uh, you know, if you have a look at all the um, the other policies that are out there, it's come at a time of what would probably otherwise be noted as a technical recession, potentially. A lot of people are still struggling. Uh, we're still coming out of COVID. There's a lot of things going on. Um, and so it just is a wise thing to reflect on the lessons of the last three years, six years, seven years, nine years, whatever, however many years you want mm. to say, and just say, you know what, there's no need to drive the bus down the road like it hasn't got any brakes on. Tēnā kōrua, kia ora. Kia taringa ariari tonu tātou ki ngā take nui o te wai whakairo nei i te āhua o tō tātou whenua. Ka nui te mihi ki te māngai pāho me irirangi te motu, nā rāua tēnei hōtaka i taunaki. We'll be back in a fortnight. Nō no horo mai. 